Good morning, church family. My name is Heather Holt. I serve in women's Bible class, and this is my daughter, Stella. She serves with the kids' choir. This morning, we'll be reading from Luke 1, verse 26 through 38. Please open your Bibles with me. If you don't have one, there's one under the seat in front of you. Luke 26, Luke 1, verse 26. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph, of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great, and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, How will this be, since I am a virgin? And the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth, in her old age, has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month with her, who was called barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. This is the word of the Lord. Well, thank you, Heather. Thank you, Stella. A special music in a kid's choir. My little Baptist heart is full. Hey, everybody. (laughs) Wow. Um, Hey, good to see you all. Uh, We continue in our series where we are looking at the principal characters in the incarnation and uh, considering through their perspective, who was Jesus to them? And then through their story, what does that show us? And uh, I believe outside of Christ himself today, we come to the most significant character in the birth narrative. And that is Mary, the mother of God. So significant is she Uh, In her life, in the Bible, and in church history, I only have a fraction of an amount of time to actually talk about her, but not only significant in her life, significant and controversial in her life and in posterity. And so we have a lot to talk about this morning as we think about Mary. So uh, I'd love to just continue in the text that we've already read, and we'll start in verse 26 of Luke's gospel, the first chapter in verse 26, because we need to answer the question, Mary, who was she? And Luke gives us a bit of a description here. Verse 26, we know from context and other places that she is a very common, very poor Jewish teenager from a one-horse town. This is why, most likely, Luke had to say she is from Nazareth of Galilee, Uh, because you actually had to get more specific regionally where she was from. One of the most fascinating things about the unfolding of God in the New Testament is how counterintuitive he chooses to make his message known. So God doesn't go to the cultural elites in Jerusalem and go, voila, here I am, but rather he, uh, Christ lives the first 30 years of his life in obscurity, I mean, like, I'm not exaggerating when I say one horse town. This isn't even like a Tyler, Texas type of situation. This is like a Mineola, Texas type situation. If you're from Mineola, if you know Mineola with its lovely Dairy Queen and East Texas hamburger, like this is where Mary's from, a uh, a one stoplight town on the outskirts of a big city that nobody really knows. And she's, again, a very poor Jewish teenage girl. We don't know how old she is. You ask a hundred scholars, they'll give you 150 different answers. We know she is a teenager. Um, At oldest, she would have been 19. Youngest, she would have been 13. Most people think she's about 15 years old. And we know that she, from verse 27, is a virgin. We also know, verse 27, that she is 
betrothed to Joseph and that Joseph is a good dude. Matthew tells us that. We'll talk more about that later. Being betrothed meant that she was um, obliged, if you will, to Joseph, and uh, they had to settle um, some family affairs, namely a bride price. Glad we don't do that anymore. And then uh, a year later, they would actually be married. But she is betrothed to Joseph. In verse 27, and we know in verse 28 that Gabriel comes and he says, Greeting, O favored one, the Lord is with you. Who is Gabriel? He also is a big deal. Uh, We know Gabriel from the Old Testament. He's the one that tells Daniel about the 70-week prophecy, which I still don't understand. Uh, And then he comes to Zechariah, talks to him, and now he is doing God's business with Mary. And he says, hello, favored one, God is with you. And think about what he, just put yourself, if you can, right there. Think about what this gal from the outskirts of the proverbial Mineola, minding her her own business, hears from Gabriel. Okay, you're going to have a kid. And your boy will be called Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of all of his kingdom, there will be no end. You know what what Gabriel just told her? He just told her (laughs) that every meaningful Old Testament promise will be fulfilled very shortly in in your womb. And what is her response? (laughs) We know from verse 29 that she is greatly troubled, terrified, as you and I would have been too, and trying to discern what in the world is happening. Anybody have sympathy for her right now in what? has happened to her. And so already troubled, verse 34, she asked a really great question. It's the right question. How? How's this going to work? I'm a virgin. How's this work? What's happening? I don't understand. She's processing. One of my favorite things about Mary is she's not presented as this like, oh, okay, great, awesome. Happy to do it. She's going, no, 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 no. But she's trying to understand how. And uh, Gabriel answers, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, verse 35. The power of the Most High will overshadow you. And the child will be called the Son of God. And we know that Gabriel also tells her that her old cousin, Elizabeth, is also pregnant, which must have been crazy encouraging to her. And that her time afterwards with Elizabeth and Elizabeth's encouragement to Mary about her calling is also encouraging. And then Gabriel ends in verse 37 with saying something that I hope you've heard before, that nothing is impossible with God. And you see this progressive faith grow in Mary's heart to the point where I'm not gonna say that she's like, okay, uh, wow, amazing, so happy and so glad. But what you do see is a posture of one who yields her heart to God. She says in verse 38, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. In other words, may I be faithful to all you're asking of me. And we know that Mary's life is changed forever. Forever. And when we think about the life of Mary and we think about who Jesus is to her, I think there are at least three things that jump out of us that are worthy of us talking about this morning. Number one, Jesus was her son. Number two, Jesus was her stigma. And number three, Jesus was her song. So let's talk about Jesus as her son, Jesus as the son of God. How extraordinary it is that Christianity would claim and that Mary would believe that God's actual son came through her. Again, I said, she's not just controversial in her life, she's controversial after her life, in posterity. 
just 400 years later, there's a bunch of dudes hanging around, and there's one, they're all bishops, and there's one guy named Nestorius, and he happens to be the bishop of Constantinople, and he is the big proponent of a new theological idea, and he has his followers, and what is his idea? It was this, that he believed that there were two distinct persons in God. So in other words, he rejected that the deity and the humanity of Jesus could exist in one person. And so to Nestorius, Mary was the mother of God, the Christocitus, Christoticus, sorry, I knew I was going to mess that up, the, the mother of God, not, so, sorry, the, she was the mother of Christ, not the mother of God, the Theoticus. In other words, Mary could not have birthed God. That's what he thought. So what happened? So the council gets together, Council of Ephesus in 431, and what do they do? They condemn him as a heretic. Get out of town, dude, you're wrong. And what did they do? They affirmed what was already clear in Scripture and what we affirm today in Orthodoxy is the hypostatic union that Jesus is both fully man and fully God at once, perfectly divine and perfectly human together in one person. And this solidified that key doctrine for us. But we don't need, as important as that is, and as much as it affirmed what scripture already taught, wherever you are on the Christian spectrum, so there's the Catholic perspective, the Protestant perspective, and then the Eastern Orthodox perspective. If you are a Christian, if you assume basic biblical orthodoxy, here's what you have to admit, have to, have to admit, that something mysterious and otherworldly happened in the incarnation. Something just completely out of this world happened. And I think it begs a really important question, especially for us many of us with a Catholic background, because we know like you can't go to a cathedral. You can't study art history. You can't even go to St. Monica's right there at, at Walnut Hill in, in Midway without seeing Mary everywhere. Statues, she's on the wall. She's everywhere. She plays a really significant part in Catholic doctrine. And so I thought it would be important to talk just briefly about why would they put so much emphasis on Mary because they clearly elevate the mother of Jesus above what we do here. Let me briefly talk about two things. Number one, both Catholics and Protestants agree on the virgin birth. That's just baseline orthodoxy. That's permission to play, right? But Catholics will go further than Protestants, and they will call what happened here in the incarnation the Immaculate Conception, meaning they believe that Mary was actually preserved from original sin because of the merits of Christ. Now, this doctrine was not completely affirmed until 1854 by Pope Pius IX, and it even had big detractors like Thomas Aquinas, who was like, I don't buy that, that Mary was without sin. But they believe that there was something significant to Mary's constitution, that she was without sin because she was the mother of God. They also believe something that might even be more significant, more controversial, if you will, and that is that she is the queen of heaven. And what does this mean? It means that she's the mother of the church, not to be worshiped per se as Christ, but venerated and prayed to. Uh, in fact, the Hail Mary, the Catholic Church's most famous prayer, is actually going to come from Luke's account of the birth. Um, and the Catholic Catechism also makes clear that her uh, mediation, her prayers, or praying to her, don't take away from Jesus's prayers, but actually flow from Jesus's prayers, but that her prayers, Mary's prayers, are important and powerful. So they clearly have a central place in not just history, but their ongoing formation and discipleship for the mother of God. What is the Protestant response? Okay, well, we know a couple things. One, that several hundred years ago, a bunch of Protestants got together and said, yeah, we don't think so. And, um, and, and they joined what we would say is a, is a protest. That's the root word of the Protestant under, so we're Baptist or Protestant people, um, and said, hey, we're not with you all the way. 
we're with you on some core things, but we ain't with you all the way. And uh, for what it's worth, there's actually not one singular Protestant re response. Uh, Anglicans believe something different than even Baptists do at times about Mary. But at the core of the conversation is the question of authority. You see, the Roman Catholic Church believes that the Bible is the word of God, but they also ele elevate tradition and authority, namely the authority of the bishops with the lead bishop, the Bishop of Rome, who is the Pope, and who has an equal say in the formation and the doctrine of the church. The Protestant response to that was to say, we believe that the authority of God is found in scripture alone. And so it's an issue of authoritative interpretation. And so the general Protestant response to Mary, the mother of God, with respect to the immaculate conception is this, that there's nothing that leads us to believe that Mary or anyone else for that matter was sinless and that we believe Paul, we take him at his word, that all have, fall sin, all have uh, sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The Bible makes clear of Jesus's perfection and no one else's. And with respect to Mary being the queen of heaven, scripture also gives no indication of her intercessory role. Paul will go so far as to also make clear in 1 Timothy 3, 5, that there is one mediator between God and man, and that person is Jesus. And so there are deeply held perspectives, different perspectives within orthodoxy, within the orthodoxy of Christianity. And let me say this, okay? Um, I think you have to be careful to be so ecumenical that you just embrace everything, okay? Um, you can be so open-minded that your brain can fall out. Somebody told me that one time, okay? Um, and so I think it's right and good to be able to generally or generously settle in that spectrum of this is what we convictionally believe. And as Protestants, we don't buy this doctrine. We don't affirm it. But on the other side of town, man, if you are looking for some kind of Catholic bashing, whatever, then you ain't gonna find it here. You ain't gonna find it with me, okay? I was born Roman Catholic. I was baptized Roman Catholic. Some of the most wonderful people that I've learned from in my life are Catholics. Some of the people I love the most are Catholic, many of whom love Jesus. Are there Catholics that love Jesus? Yeah, you better believe it. Who have an abiding faith in Jesus Christ. He is the hero of their life. And are there Catholics who don't love Jesus? Yes. Just like there are Baptists who don't love Jesus and don't have an abiding faith in Christ. And so I would say this, if the Roman Catholic, if the Roman Catholic um, vision of Mary goes too far, here's my question for us. Do we go far enough? What do I mean? Like, we are talking about the Theodicus. We are talking about the mother of God. Do we think deeply about Mary? Do, do we see her there like this young, obscure, lower class woman who possessed in her womb God himself, one person containing two natures, that, that through the appearance of scandal, that's what it was, scandal? That God would, would bring about redemptive history? Do, do we recognize that like when God chose to unfold the most wonderful news in human history, he doesn't go like the Travis and Taylor way? He doesn't say like, who, who, who's, the, who, who's the most powerful power couple in the universe and how can I promote them at the highest level of like, you know, Madison Avenue glamour and go viral with this message around the world? How do I march down Broadway with my message of salvation? He does the, he does the literal opposite of that. He goes to proverbial Mineola to this poor teenage girl 
through the proclamation of something that's absolutely hard for her to stomach, and she's a woman of faith, she's highly favored, and he says, your life and everybody else's for that matter are going to be forever changed because God himself will be in your womb. Do we marvel at that? On September 21st, 1982, at St. Paul Hospital in Dallas, Lauren Younger gave birth to her first son, Matthew. I'm standing right here. And while I have given her many problems, I made her a mother that day. And Jesus made Mary a mother. This is her son, the human being. What does that mean? She birthed him. She nursed him. She burped him. She snuggled him. She kept him warm. She fed him. She taught him. She worried about him. She remembered her, his first day of school. She watched scholars marvel at his knowledge. She saw his beard come in. She saw him learn Joseph's trade. She saw many years with him in the quietness of their small home before the world knew who he was. She saw his meteoric rise in popularity. She saw his conflict. She saw the pushback. She saw the criticism and she literally watched him die. She heard him speak on the cross. This is her son. He looked like her. This is her DNA. And she cherished and pondered these things in her heart. Do we stop and consider the fact that God used life on life connection to redeem humanity? Like, and and if you think about that, like he redeemed humanity through humanity. This is one of the primary points that Paul makes in his letter uh, to the Galatians. That like, like God, he could have done, like he, he could have created himself from nothing. He'd already done that with Adam and Eve. That was possible but yet he completely goes through the human experience. Why? Because he wants to completely redeem the human experience. He looks at the brokenness of the human experience and says, the man and the woman are the high point of my creation and I can redeem it and I can make it whole by going through it. And he chooses a woman in obscurity in a nowhere town to dignify and redeem the human story. And Mary treasured these things in her heart as she beheld her son. But he wasn't just the human son, he was the divine son. This boy would look like her in every way except be without sin. And because God was his father, that means he did not inherit Adam's guilt, that he was different. And she cherished and she pondered these things in her heart. Do we cherish and ponder the incarnation in our hearts? Sure, I think the Roman Catholics go too far. Do we go far enough? We don't need Mary statues, I don't think. We don't need to pray to Mary, I believe, with confidence. But do we consider what God was doing in this marvelous mystery of the incarnation? It's astounding. He was her son. Divinity and humanity in one person, and that is astonishing to behold. Secondly, Jesus was her stigma. What is a stigma? What is a stigma? A stigma is a mark of disgrace associated with a particular circumstance, quality, or person. It is not a verdict, but it is nonetheless something that stays with you, sometimes for a lifetime. If you've ever been falsely accused of something, you know what it's like for a verdict to not be true and yet a stigma to remain. And here's Mary minding her own business, working her chores before Gabriel shows up and he's like, hey, you're preg. And she's like, what? You know what makes her different? You know what makes her different? Unlike everyone else in the Bible, every other woman had a known husband. Like, okay, you two go together. Not her. 
She was betrothed. But she knew the scandal. Joseph knew the scandal. For what it's worth, uh, we, we C.S. Lewis called this chronological snobbery. We think that we're smarter than the previous generation. Every generation thinks they're smarter. Um, Mary and Joseph knew exactly where babies came from, okay? They knew what had happened. And they knew that the accusation would have been that what happened between Mary and Joseph happened too quickly at best or that there was another person who Mary wasn't telling anybody about. And that was the stigma that would stay with her. So uh, we see this in Matthew's account of the birth story that she's betrothed to Joseph, found to be with child from the Holy Spirit, Joseph doing the same thing that I would do, exact same thing, probably more just, because the Bible says being a just man was unwilling to put her to shame and resolved to divorce her quietly. Why? Because this isn't how things are supposed to happen. And so what they step into, what they don't sign up for, but what they step into is a life of being completely misunderstood for the rest of their life. We don't know much about Mary from the scriptures after the death of Christ, but we don't need to have an account to know that this stigma stayed with her her entire life. If they hated Christ, they would have disbelieved the story about where he came from. And they would have, they, they, they would have lied and mocked and disbelieved Mary too. Oh, sure, God got you pregnant. Tell me more. And as much as we love a good morsel of gossip, as much as we find ourselves gravitating to gossip websites and everything else, the same thing was happening there. And word of this scandal scattered in every direction. And so Mary embraces for a lifetime by God's design the stigma of Christ. And in doing so, God will bring her into the mystery of how he works through the mess of not having the final word and of being misunderstood and mischaracterized and not knowing how it's all gonna play out, but submitting her will to his life and letting him have the final word. So what does she do? She sings. Last point, Jesus is her song. The significance of a song in the Bible is too much to be missed. Women sing in response to victory. That's a theme. Miriam, Deborah, Hannah, just to name three, they sing. Why do we sing? We sing because prose doesn't go far enough. It's this physiological reaction that goes, I I have to do more than just say words right now. I was with my friend, a couple weeks ago, we were at a restaurant on Lovers, uh, a, a sandwich restaurant, and they have uh, cornhole in the back. And uh, uh, good, good friends, and uh, I have a six-year-old, he's kind of an alpha. They have a six-year-old, he's kind of an alpha. And uh, they were playing cornhole, I think, for the first time. And uh, they're a Longhorn family, and we're an Aggie family, and so that just adds to the, you know, the fuel. And there's, you know, there's just some things that are only going to be redeemed in the new heaven and, and new earth, right? And, um, and so uh, they start, you know, playing cornhole and my son particularly hits a good shot, I guess, sandbag, whatever it is. And uh, out of nowhere, he just goes in like his most dude perfect way. He's just like, let's go. And then he starts doing the gritty, which I'm not gonna do for you now. <laughs> and, you know, and it, just, and it was this little song just burst out of his heart. I'm like, where in the world did that come from? You know, it was his own little song and his own little gritty. Why? Because there was, like, like prose wasn't enough. What, like that moment wasn't meant for prose. It's why at a wedding you dance. You do, the, you do the vows, you do the nuptials. Those are important. You speak words, but you don't go to the reception and just keep talking. You dance and you sing because your heart explodes. And that's what Mary does. Her heart explodes into a song. And we've already heard that song beautifully sung over us. So let's look at it briefly in a little more detail. Verse 46. Mary said, my soul magnifies the Lord. 
and my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. Magnify just means to make bigger. Rejoices means to take joy in. And Mary says, I've zoomed in on God and have found my joy in him. That's where my hope is, is in the Lord. Verse 48. For he's looked on the humble estate of his servant. For now all generations will call me blessed. That word is the same word that Jesus said he looked upon them with compassion. This is not a boast. She's not, you might see that she's a little proud in this moment. Like, hey, people have looked upon, that's not what's happening. She is saying, I have been seen by God. This isn't about like my individual, God has seen me and that is my boast. I've been seen by the Lord. I have been seen by God. Verse 49, she starts to speak about him. For he who is mighty has done great things for me. And holy is his name. His mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. What she's saying is not new. She has not come to faith. But she's speaking of a faith that she already has. And she's speaking in principle about the mercy of God, that he's a God of mercy. He's a God of compassion. He's a God who doesn't judge us according to our will, but has mercy. That his heart is for us. And then she goes a little prophetic, verse 51. Don't miss this. He's, he has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts, and he's brought down the mighty from their thrones. And he's exalted those of humble estate, and he's filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he has sent away. Do you hear this? He has scattered the proud in the imaginations of their hearts. Scattered. Uh, I love the King James translation. Uh, we say thoughts here that the uh, King James says imaginations. He has scattered the imaginations of the proud. What is happening in the head of the proud is they are consumed with themselves. Mary says God will scatter that directionally away from the place of where God dwells. He has brought down the mighty from the throne. Those who have elevated themselves will find themselves chopped down. And then he sends away the rich empty. Those who have accumulated for themselves will be sent away with nothing. Do you see what's happening here? This is actually the reversal of the social position. This is taking the ethos of Dallas, Texas, this is taking this place where we live where it is, about, uh, it is about accumulation and it is about title and it is about significance and it is about self-importance and it's about accumulating. And it's not about just today's bread. It's about bread for decades from now. And he's saying that, that what he's doing is that he's flipping that on its head so that everybody who's just consumed with themselves will get what they want. They'll be scattered They'll be sent away hungry. They'll be chopped down. They'll be isolated with their thoughts for the rest of their life, like, like far outside the, the, the blessings of community. But conversely, the humble and the hungry will be blessed. They are the ones, What? why? Because they're the ones who see God. They're the ones that are humble enough to experience God. Does that mean that you have to take on poverty and never make any money and never have any sick? No, not at all. But it does mean that you have to come to the end of your life as the self-actualization project where all you are about is chasing your dreams and missing the people around you. Because if you can never do that, you'll never see God. You'll only see yourself. You'll see exactly what you want to in the mirror. You'll see you, but you'll never see anybody else. And what Mary says is those who are humble and hungry, like her, those who have thrown away the prospect of this perfect life, those who have entered into suffering and the suffering of others, those who know when the self-actualization project is over, they're the ones that are gonna see God. And then she ends verse 54, 55. He's helped his servant Israel 
in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and to his offspring forever. She's speaking of the covenant. She's speaking of what she's been discipled into. The promise of God, the fact that all of these promises in the covenant she has just found out reside in her womb. And she's remembering that this is not just what God has done for her. This is what God has done for us. And she is embracing in humility her part in the story. Jesus was her song. And so as we wrap up, just a couple questions for us. Mary was united to her son, both physically, but also spiritually. She was united to him in body and soul. That's what made her unique. Do we as Christians see ourselves as we are united to the Son? What do I mean by that? Are we hearing his voice? Are we abiding with him? Are we keeping up with his spirit? Is he our lives? Is it not us, but him through us? That is the stated goal of our Christian fruitfulness. More of Christ and less of ourselves. Do you see yourself united to the son like Mary? He was her son physically, but united to her son spiritually. Do you see yourself the same way? Secondly, Mary wore his stigma. Do we wear his stigma? Do, you, do, you, do we jointly, do, do, we, do we gladly join Mary in bearing his reproach? in being misunderstood. You know, in our cultural day, Christianity continues to lose capital. We continue to have to make uh, more of a defense for why we believe what we believe in the marketplace. And that's a hard thing for a lot of us to wrap our minds around. But do we find ourselves fearful of the stigma of Christ? Do we find ourselves pushing what we truly believe away into the margins, hoping that nobody asks? because of how we're represented on CNN or what that might mean somebody thinks of us? Are we scared to talk about the stigma of Christ? And you're right, guys, they say really, they, they increasingly say hard things about us that are not true, but worse things have already been said. The worst things have already been said about us, okay? All you need to do is study a little bit of church history because they were called cannibalist when they came together to, to take the bread and the cup. They're like, you're, you're feasting on Jesus? How we, and they were called incestuous, that they practiced incest because they called each other brother and sister of lo in love. Has anybody been called incestuous? Has anybody been called a cannibal? No. So don't worry what they call us on CNN, Okay. And yeah, sure, there's some deconstruct. There's no doubt there's some work to do to get to the heart of Christ. But our call is to embrace the stigma that he bears and to remember that hanging out with people in Jesus' name is a great thing, but the power of the gospel are words. With the courage to tell somebody, Jesus Christ is the resurrected king of the universe and he has redeemed my life and he can redeem yours by putting your trust in him. The power is in those words. That's the power of the gospel. And does the stigma of Christ make us fearful to share those things? If, if, it, if so, look at Mary and behold her trust amidst the stigma. And the last thing is Jesus, your song. All of us have a song. Everybody's singing a song. Do we magnify and take joy in him? Are we humble and hungry enough to sing of his mercy? Are we singing his song for others to hear? And are we like Mary willing to trust him with anything that he brings into our lives and still sing about it in the end? Pray with me. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for Mary and her faith. And I ask that you would allow us to increase in our faith. And we thank you for her life. And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen, amen.